for equipping hour this morning, we're going to be talking about an issue that really is, is a topic that, that comes up quite often, and uh, that's the issue of how do we help children understand assurance of salvation. And so I'm looking forward to this topic. I think we're going to be looking at this the next couple of weeks. Um, so as we begin, let's just uh, begin our, our morning. Let's commend our, our morning, both services to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll dive in. Father, thank you so much for the resurrection. Thank you so much for our salvation. We, um, we, have no, uh, we have all reason, every reason to worship you every moment of our existence simply because of what we're celebrating this weekend. You have secured salvation. You have proven that the death of your son was sufficient. And it was not a, a fictional sacrifice. It was a very real death. And it's not a hypothetical atonement or a hypothetical offer of righteousness. We're, we're not left wondering whether you were pleased with his sacrifice because the tomb is empty. And so thank you for these objective grounds of assurance, the, the guarantee that the gospel is true. And um, Lord, on this particular morning as we dive in and we think about an important issue that affects all of us, not just our children. It affects every individual, every soul created in your image. We ought to want to have an assurance that we are on good terms with you, assurance that the gospel applies to us, assurance that our faith is real. And so I pray that uh, we would be able to think very biblically about this. And my prayer, Lord, this morning is that as a result of thinking about these texts and these truths over the next couple of weeks, that every true child would have, every true child of yours, every true Christian would have a firmly established and secure and biblical assurance of their salvation. And everyone who is not truly your child, regardless if they thought they were or not, that they would, if they are not your child, that they would not have assurance. But this, that these truths would Show them their need for a faith that rests exclusively in your Son, a faith that trusts and waits on you, rests in you, is confident in you and your provision of righteousness, and is putting all of their spiritual eggs in that basket, the basket of your gospel. And that they would then find a true and robust saving faith uh, that would actually prove itself in their life and fuel more biblical assurance. So Lord, I just pray that this would be a real ministry and benefit to all of us. Thank you so much for giving us a clear word, and as has been said by many in the past throughout the history of the church, a clear word is the only way we could know whether we truly are saved or not. And so thank you for giving us that, and I pray that you would clarify it in our minds so that we could know whether we are your child or not. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, assurance of salvation is absolutely critical. And it's interesting that when we talk about assurance of salvation, we're, we're, we need to be really clear because there's a lot of, a lot of topics and uh, things that we need to distinguish between. First of all, it's important to distinguish between the grounds of salvation and the means of salvation. So in other words, there's a difference between the answer to the question um, on what basis am I saved, or why am I saved? The cause of salvation. And the question of how am I saved? By what means am I saved? Now, that's a really important distinction there. And um, so if I'm just speaking to the parents here for a moment, this becomes really, really important for us as we help out, help out our, our children understand the distinction here. What's the cause of my salvation versus what's the means of my salvation? Well, salvation is by faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says it very clearly, very simply. The means of salvation, how I'm saved, is by believing in Christ. But on what basis am I saved? What's the cause of my salvation? Faith is not the cause of my salvation. If the cause of my salvation were my faith, man, I'd be in a lot of trouble because I have never believed well enough to have earned salvation. The cause of my salvation is exclusively 
the character of God and the cross work of Christ in my place. The cause of salvation is uh, the death and burial and resurrection of Christ and his satisfying the Father's wrath and then his giving salvation, giving righteousness, a righteous standing to me as a sinner. That's the cause of salvation. And how that becomes applied to me is by faith, believing. However, we also need to distinguish salvation, not only why we're saved and how we're saved, but the grounds of enjoying assurance. This is a question not how am I saved. This is a question of how do I know, if, my, if I'm saved by faith, how do I know that my faith is real? And this becomes a real important question because on the basis of answering this question biblically is the difference between enjoying the Christian life and um, perpetual misery of not knowing whether I'm even on good terms with God or not. So, the grounds of enjoying assurance, how do I know that my faith is real? That's a different question than, you know, how do I know that the gospel is real? And sometimes theologians have made the distinction between an objective grounds of assurance and subjective grounds of assurance. And so, let me just say this is a sweet Sunday to be talking about this because objective grounds of assurance, I mean, the greatest one is what we're celebrating this morning, an empty tomb. Uh, an objective ground of assurance would be, well, how can I know that the gospel is true? Give me assurance that what the Bible says about the gospel is true. And um, if we answered that by going outside the Bible, uh, there's no hope there. <laughs> the Bible gives us all the grounds for objective assurance. And namely, um, Fulfilled prophecy. This is exactly what God said salvation would look like um, millennia before it actually happened. An empty tomb. Eyewitness account. John says, look, I saw, I saw the soldiers pierce his side. I saw them bury him, and I saw his resurrected body. I saw it. Eyewitness account of these realities. And so all of this is objectively assurance that the gospel is true. But then when it comes to how we're saved by this objectively true gospel, we must believe and that begs the question, but, but how do I know that I actually am, in, am believing? Is my faith real? And so sometimes it's very common for even, especially children growing up in the church, to be hearing the gospel and hearing the truth and hearing the Bible taught and even asking the question, I don't doubt that the gospel's true. I don't doubt that Jesus rose from the dead. I don't doubt that the tomb's empty. I know that that's true, but I'm concerned, mom and dad, that sometimes I don't know if I'm actually believing. So that's the question that's different than the objective assurance of the gospel. It's sometimes what we call the subjective assurance of the gospel. And so it's critical that parents, we recognize, we must recognize that assurance cannot come from man. Assurance that comes from man is fallible. It's not trustworthy and it's not helpful. We don't want to give our children assurance we don't want them to come up with arbitrary grounds for assurance. We don't want them to look inside and look inward and just do, you know, what do you think? And you're the judge of whether you're, you're truly believing or not. Assurance better not come from man, either from parents or self or anyone else. Assurance, if it's going to actually be a true assurance, it must come from God. And there's a text that really helps us introduce this. Um, and, and I want to introduce this from 1 John. And this is not, we're, we're still not going to get to the grounds of assurance for just a moment. That'll come here in a bit. And I have, I have five of them. And, and I, don't, I know we're not going to get through two of them. So several will be waiting for next week. But we'll see how far we get. But just to introduce this topic of, you know, assurance. And there's a subjective element where we're sitting there in our own minds. And our conscience at times will bear down on us. And we will begin to ask the question about whether we are in Christ. There's a very helpful passage in 1 John chapter 3. Um, 1 John <clears throat> chapter 3, verses 19 and 20 are a very helpful verse. And this is helpful for us, all of us, parents, children, teens, students, doesn't matter. Um, in verses 19 and 20, we find out that sometimes our conscience will condemn us and our conscience will tell us, you don't have assurance, you shouldn't have assurance, and sometimes it might be wrong. And so this is why this is such an important question. Verse eight, uh, chapter 3, verse 19, we will know by this that we are of the truth 
and will assure our heart before him in whatever our heart condemns us. For God is greater than our hearts and knows all things. Wow. Look at those verses. And look at those verses in light of the question we're asking. How can I have assurance? Not assurance from myself, not an assurance from parents or a a preacher or a Bible study teacher. How can I have assurance from God? And not from self especially. That's what John's dealing with because sometimes our hearts are going to condemn us and he even wants to give us grounds for assurance even if your fallible heart is going to tell you, you don't have assurance. Because guess what? If my heart tells me that I don't have assurance, can I deceive myself? Sure. And it actually works both ways. Can my heart deceive myself that I do have assurance and that I don't have assurance? And could both be wrong? Sure. I need assurance from God. I can't trust myself. And that's what John's doing here. We know by this that we are of the truth and we will assure our heart in whatever our heart condemns us. He's giving us a, an infallible way to know, am I actually believing? Am I a Christian? Am I in Christ? Am I on good terms with God? Am I forgiven? Because sometimes our hearts are going to deceive us. And so before we look at this passage here for a little bit, let me just say this. To, to experience assurance of salvation... Not an assurance that comes from somebody telling you, hey, I think you're saved. Oh, good. Joe thinks I'm saved. Not because I came up with some sort of arbitrary test. Like, well, if I'm saved, then this is going to happen today. And then that happens today. Oh, good. I'm saved. We we can deceive ourselves a thousand ways from Sunday. If If I have assurance from God, if God's word gives me infallible marks of salvation, and then I look at my life submissively to the scriptures, and God's pointing out, hey, guess what? This is what it looks like to have true and saving faith. Well, now I have an assurance that is not flawed or fallible. It's trustworthy. And believer, if your assurance comes from God, bank on it. You're his child. No wonder Thomas Brooks titled his book on assurance, Heaven on Earth. That book is not a a book, it could be a good title too for eschatology, but it's not. It's a, it's a book on assurance because it's talking about knowing infallibly that I am in Christ, that his cross work applies to me, that I am completely forgiven. And to have that state of mind is heaven on earth. <laughs> what could be better? We might as well be in heaven. If God has told me before I get there, you're mine. <laughs> wow. Thank you, Lord. That's what I want for all of God's children. And that's what God wants for us. Um, And so, I have a quote here from Thomas Brooks that kind of illustrates why this is such an important question that we're asking this morning. He says this, It is one thing for me to have grace. It's another thing for me to see my grace. It is one thing for me to believe, and another for me to believe that I do believe. (laughs) It is one thing for me to have faith and another thing for me to know that I have faith. Now, assurance flows from a clear, certain, evident knowledge that I have grace and that I do believe. Now, this assurance is the beauty and top of a Christian's glory in this life. It is usually attended by the strongest joy with the sweetest comforts and with the greatest peace. It is a pearl that most want a crown that few wear. And then Brooks continues, assurance is, assurance is not the essence of a Christian. It is required uh, to the well-being, to the comfortable and joyful being of a Christian. But it is not required to the essence, to the being of a Christian. A man may be a true believer and yet would give all the world were it in his power to know that he is a believer. To have grace and to be sure that we have grace is glory upon the throne. It is heaven on this side of heaven. And that's so true. And that's what John helps us with right here. Because in John 3, 19 and 20, he points out that there will be situations, even in the child of God, even in a true Christian's life, in your walk with Christ, there can be a season where your heart is going to condemn you. And that may or may not be true. It may or may not be true. You just can't 
trust your own arbitrary criterion, any less than you can trust somebody else telling you, well, I think you're a Christian. It's got to come from God. And so in verse 20, in whatever our hearts condemns us, John gives us the criteria where we can actually assure our hearts before God. Here's what happens. If I don't have criteria to get outside of myself to answer this question about assurance, I can do a lot of damage. We can send signals to our soul that we're not saved and when we are, and we can send signals to our soul that we aren't saved when, or yeah, that we are saved when we're not. And both are tragic. When I was in high school, I worked at a grain elevator, and uh, some of you don't even know what that is, but in the Midwest, you harvest your grain, you put it in a grain elevator, and, and so I used to work at the grain elevator, just big, big massive silos, and, and uh, you know, we used to have to do, you know, maintain the silos, and there, you know, there's a, you know, 120 feet tall, and, you know, this thing holds a million bushels of wheat, this, this organization that I worked for, and and I remember one, one job that we had, there was about three of us working behind the grain elevator on some drainage, and we were working on water drainage, and it was going toward the railroad tracks. And so we had digging bars and shovels and wheelbarrows and everything. We're moving dirt, trying to get, the, 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 you know, get it to, to grade properly so the water didn't go into the, into the um, conveyor belts and uh, the boot pits underneath the uh, silos. And so we're out there working, and we find out that you know, if you put a digging bar, a big metal bar, across the railroad tracks, it completes the continuity the battery-powered continuity, and then it turns off the, cr- the, cross- the, the, the crossing arms at the intersection downtown. Now, downtown in a town of Winona, Kansas, a population of 180, um, 180 period, not 180 comma, with zeros after it, 180 period. Um, y- you have to wait a long time before somebody actually comes to get caught by the crosswalk. So we would probably just leave it there until, and you know, keep watching until finally a car came. Okay, now we'll lift it up and they can go through. And, uh, you know, we think what, what an interesting picture of, the, of a signal that's being sent over to the, cross, the crossing arm, and the traffic is getting the signal, okay, there's a train coming. But obviously there's no train coming. It's just continuity is making through this, through this little digging bar. So it's a, it's a false signal. And guess what? We can have false signals, and it's, it's disastrous when it happens. In December 12th, 1988, at Clapham Junction in England, this is a massive railway intersection. Three trains um, crashed simultaneously. It in, resulted in 35 deaths and nearly 500 injuries. It happened at 8:10 a.m., but the last body wasn't removed until 3:45 p.m. It was just a massive, massive disaster. Now, this is in December 12, 1988. The cause: train conductors were diligently following the signals given them at the junction, but the problem was a faulty signal because they had been miswired. And I think that's what happens in our conscience. If our conscience begins to answer the question, am I truly a Christian? And the criteria on which we make that, answer that question is wrong. We're getting, we might even listen to the signals, but it's, just, it's the wrong signal to begin with. We've been miswired from the get-go. And what's so sweet of the Lord and what's so kind of our God is that he gives us a clear word so that we, his, he wants his children to have assurance. If you're in Christ, he wants you to have assurance. And if you're not his child, he doesn't want you to have assurance because he loves both. And so whether you're in Christ or whether you're not in Christ, he wants you to have clarity so you can know. And if you're not in Christ, what hope there is to not have assurance because now you can repent and respond to the gospel. And if you're in Christ, what a blessing to have assurance from criteria that comes outside of you, not something that you came up with, not something that your parents gave you, something that God gave you. And so you can think about it this way. Imagine if I told you, uh, students, think about this. But imagine if I told you, I, am, I have assurance that I can fly. You might say, okay, well, prove it. You know, let's go out in the parking lot. And you can just take off and just show us. That'd be great. Said, no, 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 kids, I don't want to put that to the test. I don't want to put that to the test. I don't, I just, but I'm, I am very convinced that I can fly. I've just never tested it. That would be like going into eternity without having an answer to the question, am I actually in Christ? Am I actually saved? And obviously, if you think you can fly and you decided, okay, well, I'll test it over some bridge, over some waterway, and then you're going to get real wet and real embarrassed, right? And so the question then becomes, how, how do I test my, my assurance of salvation? How do I test that? How do I know if I'm in Christ before it's too late? 
And John introduces us to that very reality. And there's assurance that comes even when the conscience condemns in verses 20 and 21. So look at, look at 1 John for a second here. I've already read verses 19 and 20. And notice in verse 19, there's two lines that are very parallel. We will know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our heart before him in whatever our hearts condemn us. There's two parallel lines there. They're both parallel. They're both future tense. And both are modified by the phrase in verse 20, in whatever our heart condemns us. And so on what basis would you silence something that your heart is telling you? Only on the basis of what God said. If you silence your conscience on any other reason or any other way, you're going to sear your conscience. And so he says in verse 20, he can say this because God is greater than our hearts. Or sorry, very important. God is greater than our heart, singular, and knows all things. The only way that I can find assurance if my heart is telling me, I don't know if I'm, in, I'm saved, I don't know if I'm in Christ. The only way I would ever want to correct what my heart's telling me is because of God telling me something different. God knows our hearts. I need external criteria. I need objective criteria. I need to answer this question um, based on, on biblical evidence. The conscience, and this is what the ta- John uses the word here, heart, he's talking about the inner mechanism of our heart, our conscience. It's a, it's a mechanism that tells us something. It's, it's a co-knowing faculty. And it knows something alongside our own mental thinking. It's, it's at the root of cognizance. It's at the root of uh, co-knowledge of something. And um, Paul even talks about the conscience accusing or defending in Romans 2. And here John talks about the heart condemning. And they're talking about the same type of con- connotation of this faculty of the conscience bearing down on you. And notice, John doesn't say our hearts. He says, but our heart, singular. And it's plural, our. That's an interesting construction because now you have a plural pronoun with a singular heart. And it's kind of a distributive singular. It basically demonstrates that John's showing us we're all in the same boat. Our hearts all work the same way. And um, I don't think there's ever been a Christian who's never experienced the pangs of this inner question, am I really of the truth? John's speaking to our experience here, isn't he? He's speaking to our experience because sometimes our conscience is going to bear down on, on us. It might bear down on us because of a sin that we've recently committed or even a series of sinful thinking that we're wondering, man, where did that come from? Sometimes our conscience is going to ask us questions like this. Can Christians, can a true Christian ever respond that way? Can a real Christian even have such thoughts? Can a true believer ever do such things? And so in whatever your conscience is indicting you, you must deal with that before the Lord. And um, in verse 21 to 24, actually talk about a conscience that doesn't condemn. It's a conscience that assures you before God. That's what happens when your conscience is rightly calibrated. But here in verses 19 and 20, John's talking about what a Christian must do in order to Uh, examine his assurance when assurance is wrecked by a particular sin. Now, John's a pastoral genius here. We know that those who are practicing sin are not born of God, 1 John 3, verses 4 to 10. So earlier in the chapter, he says, if you're practicing sin, that means your life is characterized by the um, ongoing practice of sinfulness, of rebellion against God, that, that characterizes you. You are a son of darkness. And we'll actually get to that um, next week. That's going to be one of our proofs of assurance. And he points out that if your heart's condemning you for the fact that your whole life is enslaved to worshiping yourself, then, of course, you don't, you don't have grounds to assurance. No, there's no grounds for assurance if your life is enslaved to, to self-worship or some sort of sinful rebellion against God. However, we also know that every true Christian still commits sin. And so two chapters earlier, in chapter 1... He says in verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So if you're saying, well, I'm glad I have assurance because I don't sin anymore, well, then now you're a liar, and the truth isn't in you. You don't have any assurance. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So denying previous sin or denying present sin is a lie. It's a deception. Instead, verse 9, if we confess our sins... He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So John has a category 
For, look, there is sin in the life of a, of a Christian. And there is not the perpetual practice and habit and lifestyle of sin in a true child of God. He recognizes both of those are true, chapter 1, chapter 3. And so now he's just pastorally so savvy and so caring to bring us to this question, well, then how do we know the difference? How do we know the difference between, yep, Christians are going to continue battling sin, and yep, Christians are not going to be characterized by an enslavement or perpetual practice or failure? How will we know? Okay, verse 19. We will know by this. And the this is pointing forward to the previous paragraph. And the this goes from verses 11 to 18. So I know this is still getting kind of a long introduction, but I'm, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page and why it's so important that we answer this question biblically. Let's go back to verse 11. This is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the evil one and slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. We know by this that he laid down his own life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's good and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or deed, I'm sorry, with word or tongue, but in deed and truth. Here's the test. Here's the test. John's underscoring the fact that we would be foolish to merely assert that we are saved. We would be searing our conscience to silence our heart if it condemns us, asking the question, well, what about your status? Self? How are you before the Lord? What does God see when he looks at you? Oh, I'm sure it's okay. And by this, I'm going to convince my heart just because I asserted that it's true. No, no, we need to look at this test. By this you will know. And the question is the difference between love for the brethren and righteous versus unrighteous deeds. How do you know if you pass this test? Well, neither profession of love nor perfection of love is the test. It's not a professing love. You can assert, you can deceive yourself and just profess, yeah, I have love. You can deceive yourself that way. Nor is it the perfection of love, because we already saw in 1 John 1 that if you've perfected the love, then you're, you're lying. But what it is is the presence of true deeds, actually loving one another in deed and truth. He also points out the difference between love versus hate, love versus murder. You might imagine that you can easily pass this test. Well, I've never murdered a brother. But it's, a, it's an interesting equative statement here. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. It's an is statement. It's, a, it's like an equal sign between those two. It's the same construction that we saw back in verse 4. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. It's an equal sign between those two. And so we got to ask the question, do we love the brethren? Do we love the brethren even, even when it costs us, when it costs us time and resources? Do we care about our brethren? Do we love them in deed? Do we love them in truth? Consider that this love for the brethren is going to be marked by a few things. In verse 13, it's marked by the world hating us. The world hates. The world doesn't mind philanthropy. The world's totally okay with philanthropy. What the world hates is Christians loving other Christians. And so if you love the brethren, the world's going to not like that. And that's actually an encouragement for how you would think about your conscience and this answer to the question of assurance, when, even when your heart is bearing down on you. And also, it's loving sacrificially like Christ, because that's the example in verses 16 and 17. We, love, we know we love by this, that he laid down his life for us, so we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And what a great test this is, is that if we actually love brethren when it costs us. It's easy to say, I love God, John says. 
You can say you love God. He's invisible. It doesn't cost you anything. There's no manifestation of it necessarily. You just say, yeah, I love God. And you can't question that. But he says, if you love God, then you love the brethren. And now you can demonstrate that. Because suddenly, we got all the, everybody in this room to deal with. And we get to love one another. <laughs> oh, okay, now there's a test. Now it's demonstrable. So, of course, the question is not, do you love the brethren sinlessly? If you answer yes to that, then you're a liar. No Christian's ever loved perfectly. That's not the question. The question is, is your love for the brethren a real flesh and blood love? Is it not merely profession in word and tongue, but in deed and truth? Is it, is it a real love? And, and John's underscoring the fact that we'd be foolish to simply assert that we love God. The test is whether we love our neighbor in deed and truth. Paul does the same thing, by the way, in Galatians 5.14. He says that the law is summarized in one statement, love your neighbor as yourself. Think, Wait a minute, isn't the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Paul can just say the whole law is summarized in this, love your neighbor as yourself. He's not forgetting his theology. That's not an inaccurate question. He's saying you can actually boil it down in a similar sense to what John does here. It's easy to profess love for God. What about love for the brethren? And when we pass this test, we'll know that we are of the truth. We will persuade our hearts before him. Unfortunately, when it comes to um, helping children understand assurance, sometimes it's, 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 it's been unfortunate in the past, in the history of the church, especially in our church, there's a lot of manifestations that uh, we can see churches fall into or um, leaders falling into, even for good motives and good reasons, where we start not just helping children understand biblical assurance, but start to give assurance. We don't have any right to give assurance. I have no authority to do that. Um, I'm flawed and fallible. You're flawed and fallible. And so sometimes it, it's just important that we, help, we, we think about this very soberly. And let me just, let me ask, here, here's some ways to think about this, some of the ways that we've answered this question in a way that's unhelpful. It's, um, it's, it's very important that we recognize what makes someone a Christian. And so um, students and children, you can even think about these questions here. Let me ask you this. Does a Christian have Christian parents? Does a Christian read a lot? And does a Christian wear Christian t-shirts? Okay, those are three questions for you, all right? Does a Christian do those, are those three, three things true of, of, of a Christian? They have Christian parents, they read a lot, and they have Christian t-shirts. No, no, that's not what a Christian must do. Uh, those things are not wrong. They, they may be true of Christians. They may not be true of Christians. It's just a total miss. Those are not the kind of questions that we need to ask. There's another set of questions that we could ask that are a little bit more challenging to think through. And so students, uh, children, and teens, and everybody here, ask these questions. Does a Christian, number one, study the Bible? Number two, go to church? And number three, obey the laws of state and country? Okay, those are the three questions. And if you're thinking, that sounds pretty good, well, you're right. Those are all three really good. The, those, that's true of believers, but it's not yet the test, is it? Because that could also be true of unbelievers. People who aren't in Christ. There's a lot of people, I know a lot of people who aren't in Christ who study the Bible. And I know people who aren't in Christ who go to church. I know a lot of people who aren't in Christ who obey the laws of state and country. So, yes, these questions are actually true of believers, but they're also true of unbelievers. So that's not a good criteria to assure our hearts before God if we're Christian or not. And so here's, here's a, uh, an analogy. Here's, here's kind of a word picture. I think maybe it will help you kids think about how, why it's important to ask this question. How do I know, how do I really know if I'm a, if I'm a Christian? Okay, so... Kids, um, how many of you have um, pets in your house? Let's see a show of hands. The pet family is here. All right, so just so I know who I'm offending. No, just kidding. I'm not going to offend anybody. No, no, at the Anderson household, we have a dog. And um, let's suppose that we invited your family over for dinner. And um, you come over, and, and, and just to make this, I think this will make this applicable for everyone in here. Many of you have younger siblings, but maybe you don't. You're, some of you are youngest, and so you're the youngest in your home. So let's just, for the sake of this illustration, every child in here has a toddler, a sibling who's really, really young and just starting to walk around and kind of 
uh, you know, ask questions and just talking. And, but, but, but for the sake of this illustration, your toddler sibling is very, very smart. He's a very smart toddler, okay? He comes over with you, and you come into our house, and here comes our dog to come sniff everyone's shoes and say hello and pass on a, you know, a, a social media transmission to your dog at home, okay? And so he's going to do that right there, and then the, your toddler sibling says, he says, oh, wow, you know, that's, what is that? And everybody, all the siblings say, okay, that's a dog, doggy, okay? And so then your sibling says, doggy, okay? And so now he's so excited. He's learned a new word, and, and he's going to start using this word, and everything he's pointing at, he says, doggy. And so he goes over, he's in the kitchen, and he points at the table, and there's a salt shaker, and he says, doggy. And you say, no, that's not a doggy. So what do you have to do? You have to give him criteria, right? You have to help him understand what's a true dog. You say, no, 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 no. Listen, it's not a dog. Dogs have four legs. And now your brilliant, precocious toddler sibling, he learns, okay, dogs have four legs. And so instead of pointing at the salt shaker, he points at the table. Doggy. No, that's not a dog. Dogs make noise. And then... My wife turns on the blender in the kitchen, so he spins around. Ah, <gasps> noise. That's a doggy. No, they still have four legs. Oh, okay. Four legs and the and it makes a lot of noise. Because remember, this is a really smart toddler. Okay, and then I sit down in a chair and it makes a noise, it creaks, and he's oh, four legs and noise. Doggy. No, chair's not a dog. It also moves. And here comes the pet iguana. Doggy. No, it also has fur. Here comes the guinea pig. No. It eats meat. Here comes the cat. No. <laughs> you start to realize there are certain things that are true of a dog that are also true of other things that really wouldn't distinguish what's a dog. Right? Does that make sense, kids? So it becomes important not just to say what's true of Christians. We have to say what's unique for Christians. What's true only of Christians? And God gives us a lot of help in the Bible on how to think through assurance. And what's sweet about this is these are all true for adults, kids, and everyone in between. Uh, it's true for anyone that um, these, these will apply. Now, I will admit up front, there's an arbitrary uh, element to this list. I picked five. I picked five because I think they're very comprehensive. They're, they're throughout Scripture. They're, they're, I think they're somewhat attainable and, and helpful. Uh, adults. I would say this, one of my favorites that didn't make the list, one of my favorite marks of assurance, like one of the favorite grounds of assurance, comes from 1 Corinthians 2, verses 16, 6 to 16, and that is the difference between somebody who knows the truth and somebody who embraces the truth. That's a very helpful, instructive truth, and no doubt, you know, you can walk that through with your kids. I didn't include it on this list because it just, it, you know, I wanted to kind of simplify and so the fact that I picked five here is not comprehensive by any stretch of the imagination. 1 Corinthians 2 is a great text that helps us with assurance, and it didn't make the list, just because I'm trying to simplify. So hopefully that's helpful to understand what we're doing here. I did pick five that I think are helpful and clarifying for, for anyone of any age, but admittingly that this is not comprehensive. So we're going to look at grounds for enjoying assurance. In other words, on what basis can I know that my faith is true? real, genuine? Can I deceive myself? What if I'm just coming up with this faith? What if I'm just exerting faith on my own? It wasn't a faith that was given to me. Paul says it was given to you not only to suffer, but also to believe. How do I know that mine's a God-given faith? That it's, that's a tr I, can, I can bank on the fact that I am trusting the gospel. The first ground, we're going to try to, we'll try to tackle, we we'll, should be able to tackle this first one. Hopefully we can get into the second one this morning. Um, by the way, yeah, thank you for putting that slide up. You can see on the slide behind me there, there's, there's five. Those are the five that we're going to be looking at in the next uh, re remainder of our time this morning and next week. So there's five right there. First of all, killing sin. Killing sin. Killing sin is an, an important mark of the believer. Christians are in the process of putting sin to death. It's something that is currently being put to death in the life of every believer. Let's go to, in our Bibles to Romans chapter 8. This is a, an important text for assurance. 
In Romans 8, the question might be, why is this passage about assurance of salvation? And briefly, let me give you a little bit of context. If you start in verses 1 through 8, in verses 1 through 8, Paul is explaining that uh, there's a radical difference between those who are in Christ, those who are indwelt by the Spirit, and those who don't have the Spirit or are not in Christ. And his terms are, um, the, in verses uh, 6, it's the spiritual and the carnal. Um, the things of the Spirit, the things of the flesh. So the, you'll see the word flesh and spirit going back and forth throughout this section. And he concludes this section by saying, verse 6, the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. It doesn't subject itself to the law of God, for it's not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So suddenly, it becomes critical and imperative to understand, well, how do I know if I'm a spiritual person or not? And in verses 9 through 11, he explains that if, verse 9b, if anyone does not have the Spirit of God, he does not belong to him. Christ isn't, you're not a Christian. You don't belong to Christ if you don't have his spirit. And so that would be a very easy answer, wouldn't it? How do I know if I'm a Christian? Well, you have his spirit. Okay, well, how do I know if I have the spirit? It begs another question, doesn't it? So the question that uh, you want to be asking, and we all need to be asking is, you know, there's no, there's no halo that shows the spirit indwelling somebody. And there's no, no magical mark. Uh, that you have to be looking for, some sort of black light. You're just, it's just, well, how would I recognize the work of the Spirit? And that's where he goes in verses 12 to 17. So let's dive in. Romans chapter 8, verses 12 to 17. This really does explain how I can know whether I have the Spirit or not. And it becomes a ground for assurance. Verse 12. So then, brethren, we are under obligation. And that word obligation means debt. There's an obligation, there's a duty here, there's a responsibility here. We, are, we have a duty, we have an obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. And he kind of breaks off his sentence, the NES has a little M dash there, that's helpful because he just doesn't quite complete that thought before he launches to the next thought. But we know from verse 12 that even true believers still have the flesh. It's still there. The challenge we need to think about is we are not under obligation to the flesh. We're not obligated to it. We're not bound to obey it. We're not bound to carry out its impulses. We're not bound to live according to the flesh. We have an obligation to do the exact opposite. But we still have the flesh. And there's still a very real potential to give in to the flesh by way of temptation and to live like we used to live before Christ saved us. So here's where he goes in verse 13. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. And the, the literal there would be, you are about to die. If you're living according to the flesh, you're about to die. If your life could be explained for no other reason than that you grew up in a Christian home, and you have parents who taught you right from wrong, and you make good decisions because you're, you want your life to be comfortable, that's, that's not a good enough test. You, you look at this. You, you could be living according to the flesh. If you're just simply doing what's helpful and convenient for you, um, the flesh is any natural self-loving impulse that we would have and that we could have apart from the Spirit's influence. You're, if you're living according to the flesh, you're, you're about to die. But here's the contrast. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body... You will live. Wow. What, what is going on here? By the way, whatever we find in verse 13, this really clarifies a very confusing statement. Oh, not, it's not confusing. In Paul's, Paul's statement is not confusing. It's been confused quite often. In Romans uh, verses, in, in, uh, verses 14 to 17, this section has sometimes been used to kind of come up with almost a mystical uh, assurance of salvation. So parents, hear me out on this one. In verses 14 to 17, we, we don't ever want to give our kids some sort of sentimental, mystical, experiential criteria apart from what Scripture gives. There's something that's very experiential here in verses 12 to 17, and we want them to have that. We don't want them to have this undefined sense that verse 15 says, we cry out, Abba, Father. And people say, oh, you know God's your, 
You're on good terms with God when you have this, when he just feels like he's intimate with you. And you just cry out, Abba, Father. And you say, man, he's just, I just feel like God's never been closer. Now, have I, as a, ever since my conversion, have I experienced just the over, over, have I been overwhelmed with emotion at the reality that I have intimacy with God? Of course. Of course, that's a part of the Christian life. But that's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about here is, he's talking about the Spirit of God in us doing what the Spirit of God alone can do. And when that is actually realized in our life, we cry out, Abba, Father. Say, wow, God is my Father because the Spirit's doing something in my life that's way beyond John Anderson. And what's this thing that's way beyond John Anderson? What's this thing that's way beyond our ability? And that's this whole reality of putting to death sin, killing sin. So let's go back to verse 13, and um, let's think about this. If you are living according to the flesh, you're about to die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. The second half of that verse is critical to understand what the Spirit does that we could not do. Notice a couple of things. First of all, or a few things actually. First of all, notice this verb. If by the Spirit you are putting to death. It's a present tense verb. And that's really, really important because it's a tense that indicates ongoing state, a continued practice. Perhaps the easiest way to illustrate the importance of this word and this tense is to give it to you in a different tense. Think for, and parents, think about this for a second. Think about if Paul had said, if by the Spirit you have put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Wow. Think about that reality. What if that was the mark of the Holy Spirit? If you have the Holy Spirit, you will have already put to death the deeds of the, of the body. And then you go right back to 1 John 1. If you say you're without sin, you're a liar. Well, then no one has assurance. No one would have assurance. But Paul is so clear here. He's so clear. It's a present tense verb. This is a reality that never ends until we get to glory. Christians who are in, still in the flesh, but not obligated to carry out the flesh, what we're marked by is the ongoing and continued battle and victory of actually, currently, presently, in an ongoing fashion, dealing death blows to sin. Sin is being put to death in us. And now, sometimes you could, people might be prone to emphasize this present tense aspect, and they actually never actually have anything that's actually a death. There's, there's, it's, it's, we are putting these things to death. And that's kind of a challenging reality because death happens in a moment. If you think about um, animal or whatever, it happens in a moment. So what's this are putting to death the deeds of this flesh? It's, it's an ongoing reality. And so maybe it's perhaps it's helpful to picture this as a battle. Um, Pastor Todd Murray uh, used to describe this as, um, you know, we, we can get discouraged when we think we've been killing sin and we, we're in this in this battle, and it just keeps going, and it keeps going, and it keeps going, and we think, we're actually not putting anything to death. And he said, but think about it. If you're in your foxhole, and the enemy's coming at you, and you're continuing to battle and battle and battle, but you're getting tired of the battle. You're getting weary of the battle. You thought that the next hill was going to be the capital. You thought this was the next day was going to be you know, V-Day, and it's all over, victory. We, we can go home now. And the battle just keeps going, and we get exhausted and weary. He said, sometimes you just have to stop and look back in the past and say, notice, wow, there's, the enemy has been piling up around my foxhole. God has been sustaining me. There's been actual death is happening of sin, of sin. Don't, don't confuse the metaphors there. Sin is being put to death, and that's so encouraging. And so there's this ongoing reality to it, but there's an actual death that's happening. There's actually a death blow to sin being dealt. We're dealing these blows. Notice also the means of killing. Verse 13, uh, 13b, if by the Spirit. The only way any Christian has ever put any sin to death 
And the only way that any Christian is successfully currently putting any sin to death is by means of the Holy Spirit. Let's keep that truth and that observation in tandem with this next one. Notice the subject of the verb. If by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the flesh. So, Christian, you actually have an obligation to actively put sin to death. You must do it, but you must do it by means of the Spirit. Both, must be, are, both are true, and they both must be held together. I don't know if this is a helpful illustration, but hopefully, hopefully it is. I, I tried it out, I thought it through, and I, I, I left it in my notes. Anyway, here it is. I remember we had, a, we had monkey bars in our backyard uh, when the kids were young, and, and I remember you know, seeing the boys like getting the ability, the upper arm strength to start doing the monkey bars. And it was pretty high monkey bars, you know, for a little kid. It was, you know, whatever it was, like seven feet up. And so, you know, I remember April thinking, man, if they, if they can't make it across, they're going to get stuck and then they drop. Well, you know, well, they have to, you know, like break a leg or whatever. And I remember thinking, okay, well, I'll do a little test here to see how they're doing. And, um, you know, and I told them, okay, you need, to, you, need to, you need to go do the monkey bars. Go do the monkey bars. And, you know, if they said, well, I can't do the monkey bars. I'm like, you have to do the monkey bars. And I kind of just go get them on the monkey bars, and they start going across the monkey bars. And, you know, they're wearing, you know, they get halfway, and they're getting weary, and they're trying to, trying to get more momentum and swing. And then they just hang on, and they start getting tired and shaking, like, ah. Now, at this point, the question is going to be, are they just going to keep doing it until they fall, or are they just going to ask for help? Dad, can you help? You, son, you must finish the monkey bars, and I would love to help. And help them across the monkey bars, and then be able to make a point. Hey, see, that's why you don't do monkey bars on your own. You don't have that ability. And then, of course, they didn't at some point get the physical ability, and so then the illustration is no good anymore. Um, we never outgrow our inability. We are always unable to actually put real sin to death on our own, but we have all the resources we need in the power of the Spirit and in His influence in us as He has written His Word. We must put the Word in our mind, yield to what He says, follow what He tells us to do, in faith, recognizing even my commitment to do what you told me to do is not enough. So, Spirit, help me. I'm going to step forward in faith. Please produce obedience in this area. You said, kill that sin. Lord, I, I have to kill that sin. I, I'm obligated. I'm under duty. It must be put to death. But I can only do it through, your, through the means of your help. True Christians in this room who... And I'll say it this way, true Christians who currently have assurance of salvation, you know exactly what I'm talking about. When you look back at your life and you see something produced in your life in an area where before Christ you had no power. To see the Holy Spirit give you victory in an area that dominated you. I've looked at my life 19 years without Christ, and I've just thought, wow, the only way that, could have, that change could have ever occurred is supernatural power. Oh, I, have, I have a long way to go, but I, can, I will boast all day long that the change is all due to God. So, Christian... You're under obligation to put the, put the deeds of the flesh to death, but you can only do it by means of the Holy Spirit. So here's a couple questions to ask. And I, for the sake of time, I'll, I'll, I'll just tell you, you can, you can really, you, I'd really encourage you to read Colossians 3, verses 5 and 6. It's kind of a parallel passage in, in many ways. But here's some questions to, um, to ask a child. You can, you can ask a child, what sins have been difficult for you? And where have you struggled in your heart? And um, I would encourage you, parents, if your children don't know, then just help them to see their sin rightly from the Scriptures. Just continue to open up Scriptures and help them to see their sin rightly. Um, even as you ask this question, though, I would encourage you to, to withhold, even if you have a very well-informed um, conscience, you know, no one knows your kids better than you do, uh, I would still encourage you uh, to withhold any sort of opinion um, uh, you know, about, you know, when your kid says, well, well what do you think, Dad? Do you think I, I've dealt with this sin? Or do you think I'm in Christ? And it's like, well, it doesn't really matter what I think. What matters is what, what does God say? Because I don't want, again, I don't want to slip into that side of, you know, starting to 
give kids assurance or give them a lack of assurance. That's not, that's not my job. That's not our job as parents. It's our job to instruct them from the scriptures so that before the Lord, they can have answers. So when you, when you ask him this question, what sins have been difficult for you? Where have you struggled in your heart? If they don't know, then just help them see their sin rightly from the scripture. And if the answer is that they haven't, then this is an opportunity to um, encourage and even caution your child about uh, how important it is to be aware of their own sin. And so if they're not aware of any sin in their life, that's actually a very helpful and clarifying uh, mark in, in where they're at um, spiritually. So then you can come alongside over the long haul and just help them um, see their sin rightly in, in Scripture. Secondly, you can ask your, your, your children who, um, who are asking about assurance and asking about whether they're in Christ or not. You can ask them, what sins have you, have you, been, have you seen that are being put to death in your life? No, no, no living Christian has finished the mortification process, but every child of God who experiences assurance, they know this inarguable evidence that they have power where they formerly did not. It's a power beyond them. It's by means of faith, and it's supernatural power working in them and through them as they yield their will to, to, to the gospel and start walking in, in the power of the Spirit. And so when that happens, that gives your child an an assurance that what they're experiencing could not have been accomplished by them on their own willpower. And that's a really helpful thing for your child to know that because now they can, they can trust that. It's not, it didn't come from you, it didn't come from them, it came straight from God, Romans 8, Colossians 3. So that's number one, killing sin. And uh, I, guess, I guess I didn't even get started on number two, we'll, just, we'll call it there, but you know, next week we'll, we'll dive into these next four and um, hopefully this is helpful for all of us and also as parents, both just as Christians, these, these apply to us, but then also thinking about how to help our, our younger uh, children to think this through. Let me close in a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for the clarity of your word. I just think looking at these truths and these texts, thinking about the important reality, the all-important reality of wanting all of your children to have assurance, and the all-important reality that you so love those who currently aren't your children, that you want them to have assurance as well. I, I just, I'm just floored by the clarity of your word to be able to answer this question and to have true assurance. Lord, if you didn't want anyone to have assurance, all you had to do was not even give us a Bible. You so clearly want us to have assurance. And that's such a, such a kindness from you. Protect us as we evaluate our own salvation from adopting criteria that would flatter us or condemn us without warrant. I pray that our only criteria would be your criteria from your word. And as parents, help us to instruct our, our, our children in the truth so that our fallible opinion wouldn't even matter, that they would actually have transcendency not only above our discernment, but also above their own hearts, that our children would be able to assure their hearts before you whether they are in you or not whether they are truly saved or not. And I pray that, that those truths would be a blessing for the, this younger generation. There are some who might be saved already. There are some who might be saved before they leave the home. There are some who might leave the home uh, rejecting truth. But Lord, the mark of faithful parenting is, is not even necessarily what our kids know, but it's the, the, to the degree that they could know it. We've, we've given them the truth and whatever truth we've, we've given them that you could then use to bless them. And if our children find themselves in any stage of life in the future falling short of these marks that we're studying, I pray that you would graciously quicken their conscience, that they would know in a, in, in, when, if they rebelled against you, that they're outside of you, and that there's hope in the gospel. And I pray that you would use these truths to bring children to you and then also to give them assurance that they could just rejoice at the security of their relationship with you, not because of an event, not because of a prayer prayed or some sort of card that was signed or even in front of the Bible that would have some sort of moment of some religious or emotional experience, but simply because of the reality of your spirit producing in them what they never could. I pray that on the basis of that, they would know that your down payment, your spirit, your 
engagement ring to your people would be sure and secure, and that they would rejoice in you all their days. So Lord, thank you for this reality of heaven on earth, that we can know our salvation, we can know our status with you. Thank you so much for being so kind to give us that. In your name we pray. Amen.